Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord, everybody. Bless the Lord one more time. You know, it's really a privilege to be here again sharing with us in the Word of God. Um, I'm sitting in for Bishop Daly one more week, and, and chances are we might probably go about two more. You know, it all depends on how the Spirit of the, the Lord leads. Um, but I want us to, you know, just remember our bishop and his family, you know, and, you know, put them before God as often as possible. Like I said, when we started the lesson, that coming the hour come the man. And I believe that God has given us the right person. He has placed the right person, you know, to lead us during this time. You know, as we get in our Bible study, I just want us to breathe a word of prayer. So I'm just going to invite us to bow our heads as we pray. Father, we come to you again this evening. And we want to thank you for your manifold blessings. We want to thank you for your grace. We want to thank you for your awesomeness. Lord Jesus, it is all because of you why we live and why we are here. We ask God that you will take full charge of this Bible study. We ask God that your anointing will pour down upon this vessel. And that God you will use this vessel tonight to accomplish that which you will. We pray God that as I open my mouth, great Jesus, and the words come forth, they will be words, God, from your throne room, and that you will speak to your people, give your people a word in this time, Lord, because as a people, we must live for you. We thank you for what will be said tonight, and we thank you for the many hearts that you will touch. We thank you for the transformation that you will work in our lives as we give you thanks right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And can you say in Jesus' name? Amen. So I want to extend greetings tonight to each and every one of us. Um, whether you're in Jamaica, whether you're in the U.S. of A., Canada, England, you know, Germany, wherever you are, we greet you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. If you are a member of our assembly, we greet you. If you are not a member and you're just tuning into Bible study, we welcome you. You know, there is a word for you. And we are not here to look good or to, to, to be looked upon of men. But we are here to present the word of the living God. And, you know, as an individual, as I come, I, I want to make sure that I find the mind of God. So that when I speak, you know, I know that I am speaking of the Lord. You know, oftentimes I, I just want self to be removed out of the way and, and, you know, the Lord to just have his own way. As we continue our lesson tonight, we are looking at identifying and overcoming the wiles of the adversary. And uh, as we go back to our scripture taken from Ephesians chapter 6, we are going to read again. It says, finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that he might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye might be able to withstand in the evil, evil day, and having done all to stand. Amen. Amen. So we look, last week we spoke, you know, about knowing ourselves, and we look really at verse 12. Uh, we started looking at verse 12 because oftentimes, you know, as teachers, we, you know, we look at verse 12 and we talk about, you know, that the battle is a spiritual battle and that um, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. But... 
we do not look at the fact that knowing ourselves will help us to know the enemy. It's important, and as last week as we spoke, we pointed out some things so that we could understand who we are. Because if we understand who we are, then we will be able to identify the enemy. And if we are going to overcome this enemy in this time, the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And if we are going to overcome the enemy in this time, then we have got to know who we are. A lot of people in Christendom, they are not sure who they are. They are trying to identify with this world and they are trying to do the things of this world they 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 in their heart they are saying that god i want you by their mouth they are saying that god i want you but their actions are saying something else because you know they are attached to the things of this world and it's important that we know who we are right so in Verse 11, the apostle said that we should put on the whole armor of God that we might be stand against the wiles of the devil. He continued in verse 12, right? And he gives us an insight into who the enemy is. I'm still doing some recap. We said last week that we needed to look at two main points. And one is who am I? And the second is who is the enemy? We... Some time ago quoted from an article, The Art of War. And we said that if you know the enemy and you know yourself, then you need not to worry about the outcome of the battle. And we said that this statement is true if God is on your side. Because if God is on your side, then you will know that God is fighting on your behalf. We also said on the other hand that if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you are going to lose in every battle. So it is therefore important that we know who we are. Not being able to identify the enemy means certain death. Not being able to identify the enemy means that you can be ambushed at any time. Not being able to identify the enemy means the enemy can easily infiltrate your camp and take you hostage and you don't even know that the enemy was in your camp. So it's important for us, like I've been saying, that we know the enemy, but it's even more extremely important that we know ourselves. When you know yourselves, you know what you believe in. You know the standards that govern your life. When you know yourself, you know that there are certain things that you will not do. And that is how you are going to be able to identify the enemy. When you know yourself, you will know the enemy because the standards and the precepts and the statutes that you live by, the statutes that you live by, will say to you anything on the other side is the enemy. Last week we said that anything that is anti-Jesus Christ, I know myself and I'm saying Jesus, and anything that is anti-Jesus Christ is the enemy, right? I know myself and I'm a truthful person. I try to be a truthful person. Anything that is anti-truth is the enemy. Anything that is anti-righteousness is the enemy. And anything that is anti-peace, Jesus said, my peace, I give to you. If you find in your life that, you know, there is no peace, you find it hard to agree with persons around you. Every person that you go around finds some fault. There is just no peace. As a child of God, we need to check ourselves. Jesus said, my peace, I leave with you. Anything that is anti-holiness follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord anything that is anti-holiness is the enemy anything that is a fear and doubt is the enemy and anything that is anti the word of God is the enemy 
and you have got to first know yourself. If you know yourself, you will set these standards. The standard of living by the word of God. The standard of being truthful. The standard of not living in fear and doubt. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Anything that is anti-holiness, you, you know that you are just nothing to do with these things. And you know that that is on the other side of the line and those are the enemy. I asked a question last week, who are you? I hope that as we went through the week, that we give some thought to the question about who are you? Some people are still confused. Being a child of God, they are confused. They are not sure who they are. They are not comfortable with their complexion. They are not comfortable um, just being who God created them to be. The Bible says that we are beautifully and wonderfully made, but yet they are not comfortable. Persons don't know who they are in Christ, and they are trying to do the things of the world. They are trying to look like the people of this world. And as Christians, we cannot look like the world. We cannot be like the world. You have got to know who you are. And I said last week that if I should answer the question, the first thing that I would say is that I am a child of God. Uh, the, the, the number one thing is that I am a child of God. <clears throat> once you are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, once you have repented of your sins, once you have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you are a child of God. You are a son of God. And you are a child of God first. You are a son of God first, irrespective of who you are and what it is that you have accomplished and what it is that is added to your name. You are a child of God first. In St. John 1, 12 to 13, and we read the scripture last week, and it tells us, of who we are. It says, But as many that has received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which, are, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then we look at Galatians 4, 7. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then you are an hearer, and hearer of God through Christ. And as a son and hearer of God, you inherit all the blessings of God through Jesus Christ, which includes earthly and heavenly possession. Being a son of God, you have the status of being next in line. Being a son, you are right there with Jesus Christ. Because Jesus has shed his blood and he has now brought you in the family of God. You are now sitting in heavenly places and you are an heir of God. I hope we remember that the term here means that, you know, we have an inheritance of God that can never perish. If we remember the story about the prodigal son, the prodigal son was an heir to the father, and the father gave the prodigal son his portion, and he went and he squandered it. So, and here is a person who will receive an inheritance after the person has passed, or after his father has passed. So who are you? You are firstly the son of God. We went on and we said, who are you? We are a new creature. I am a new creature. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17, it says, any man being Christ, he is a new creature. 
old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Any man being Christ is a new creature. There are some things that we used to do. There are some things that I used to do before I met Christ. But now that I am in Christ, I don't do those things anymore. Now that I'm in Christ, I try to live as all Christ wants me to live. Now that I'm in Christ, I try to walk in the newness of, li of life. I want somebody to know that you are a new creature in Christ. It doesn't matter what you did before you came in contact with Jesus. Know that you are in contact with Jesus. You are a new creature. Whole things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. If you are in Christ and you have been in Christ about two years, and you have been in Christ three years and four years, and you find that it is hard to let go of some, you find that the, the changes that Christ wants to work in you is hard to come by. Something is wrong. You are not spending enough time with God. You are not trying to make the change. You are not allowing the Holy Ghost to accomplish what he wants to accomplish in you. So if we have been with Christ for a number of years, there, are, there is got to be present a change that has taken place. A, a, a change of how you do things, a change of how you speak, a change of your company, a change in your entire lifestyle. So if you find that you are in Christ, and you are going back to the things that you used to do. There is a problem. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that there is no problem. I want you to identify that there's a problem from no. My concern is about your soul. I want when Jesus Christ put in his appearance and the trump of God's sound that you will change in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and that you will be caught up to meet him. I am concerned about the spiritual man. I am concerned about your soul. And if you find that you are in a place where it's hard to change and hard to let go, you need to spend a little more time with God. And I'm not going to sit here again and tell you that it is easy. Because it is not easy. But with Christ in the vessel, you can make it. With Christ in the vessel, you can live above the things that would want to draw you back in the world. With Christ in the vessel, you will be able to overcome whatever the adversary throws at you. I don't want you to think that after a year or two years, it's going to be perfect. No. But after a year or two, you are going to be with God. There should be some changes. There, there should be some things that you just know that, look here, I am not going to do these things again. And you know the things. Because the Holy Ghost is no cause your conscience to be alive. And the Holy Ghost is talking to you through your conscience. So it is not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging at times. And at times, at times I might trip up and fall. At times we might trip up and fall. None of us is perfect. But we have to get up, brush off our clothes. And we have got to continue on this part that Christ has sacrificed for us to be on. We have got to recognize that any man be in Christ. He is a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. I want to tell us today that as Christians we need to walk in the newness of life. Because we are changed. The songwriter says, I'm definitely changed. My life belongs to Jesus. I am not the one I was. 
My life has been rearranged. The story of my life has gone from rocks to riches. Christ has made a change. The accepting of Christ in our life should make a change. And being in Christ, you are a new creature. As we continue about who I am, I want us to turn in our Bibles to St. John chapter 15 and verses 15. Uh, we will spend some time looking at who we are and probably even more time than looking at who the adversary is. Why? Because if we are able to identify who we are, then we will easily be able to identify the enemy. Right? So knowing the things that we stand for, we will know the enemy, know what he's up to. Because these are the standards that we live by. So if we turn to St. John 15, 15, he said, henceforth, who am I? Still talking about who we are as the children of God, as children of God, who are we? I am a friend of God. Henceforth, Jesus was talking to the disciples. And he said, henceforth, I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. I have called you friends. Because all things... That I've, Jesus said, all things that I've heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. So I want you to know today that you are no longer a servant. You are no longer a servant to sin. You are no longer a servant to the adversary. No longer a servant to the things of this world. But you are a friend of God. The songwriter says, I am a friend of God. And today I want you to know if you feel like you do not have a friend, I want you to know that you have a friend that's ticket closer than a brother. And this friend is Jesus Christ. Today, if you are watching and you do not have a person that you can talk to, you feel so alone, you feel out of this world, I want to tell you that there is a friend in need and Jesus is a friend indeed. And Jesus is ready to be your friend. You are unsaved and you do not have a friend. Jesus is ready to be your friend. So, child of God, you are no longer a slave, but you are a friend of Jesus Christ. Who are you? I am a friend of Jesus Christ. And these are important to us. Because... In time, there are times in our life when we will feel lonely and feel like we just don't have anybody. Hallelujah. And there might just be somebody that is streaming that just feel this way. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I want you to know that Jesus is your friend. Let us turn again in our Bibles to the book of Ephesians 1, verses 3. Who are you who am i i am blessed hallelujah to god with all or with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places blessed be the god and father for our lord jesus christ who had blessed us with all hallelujah spiritual blessings in heavenly places in christ Though you are on earth, you are in heavenly places. The Greek word for blessings here is eulogia, which means benefit. So you are blessed with all spiritual benefits. These spiritual blessings that Paul talk about might not entice everybody because some persons might be looking for the physical blessing. You know, when we talk about blessings, 
if we don't see a car or if we don't see a house, if we don't see a job, we don't consider that as blessing. But as we look at the passage in Ephesians 1 verse 3, the apostle tells us that we are blessed with all spiritual blessing. I am rejoicing tonight to know that I am blessed with all spiritual blessing. These spiritual blessing Paul referred to weren't just ideas. They weren't just nice ideas that Paul had, had thought of. But they were realities that the apostle himself experienced. And he was now able to say to the Ephesians that you are blessed with all spiritual blessing. Ultimately, we live and we experience this spiritual blessing. But we might not realize because our focus is somewhere else. How many of us are content with spiritual blessing? Or, though we are blessed spiritually, we still strive for earthly blessing. How many of us sometimes go over the edge to gain the earthly blessing, our so-called blessing? Instead of towing the line, instead of staying on this side of the line, we go over on the other side of the line, over the enemy's side, to, side, to get something that we consider a blessing. Oh, glory to God. But our focus is somewhere else. And we have to know, we have to understand that we are blessed. We are privileged folks. And we are blessed with all spiritual blessing. For some folks, if we don't see the material thing, we think nothing is going on. But nothing is further from the truth, child of God. Nothing is further from the truth. That is a plan of the adversary. The adversary wants you to think that if you can't see it, hallelujah, Jesus, you're not being blessed. And that is what the adversary, oh God, wants you to think. But don't you know that God has treasures stored up in heaven for you? Don't you know that the Lord God has begun to prepare that place for you? The there are folks who spend their time on earth, all their blood, sweat, and tears, trying to achieve the things of this life. But I've never seen the dead carry a house in the casket. I've never seen the dead carry a vehicle in the casket. I've never seen the dead carry their money in the casket. I want you to understand that you are a privileged individual because you are blessed with all spiritual blessing. Who am I? I am proud to say that I am blessed with all spiritual blessing. As we look at the book of Ephesians, we recognize that Paul goes on to talk about the spiritual blessing. And if we look from verses 4 down through to 19, Paul mentioned these blessings, what these heavenly blessings, these spiritual blessings are about. In verses 4, he mentioned that you are chosen before the foundation of the... How many of us know that God has chosen you before the foundation of the earth? That is a blessing to know that I have been chosen before the foundation of the earth. And I want you to understand that God is not partial so it's not that God chose you over anybody else. When he died, he did not die for you alone, but he died for everyone. It is just that God in his omniscience, he knows that you would be the one that would accept the call. The Bible says any man come to God, God will call them. God call you and you answer. And he might have called your brother or your sister and they did not answer the call. But you are blessed. You are blessed with all spiritual blessing because you were chosen before the foundation of the world. In verse 4 again, he said that you should be holy and without blame, mighty God, Jesus. I want you to know that God has chosen you and he, you are holy. 
and he chosen you that you should be without blame. I want you to know that the adversary cannot lay any blame at your feet because Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, took all of that blame. Once you have repented of your sins, Jesus took. That is why repentance is important. The adversary, he is an accuser, he's a blamer of the bridging. But I want you to know that Jesus took that blame. In verse 4 again, the apostle said that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Again, love is a blessing. You, some people feel like they don't have love. I remember Bishop said that one person came to church and when they were hugged, that is before the corona, that is one, when they were hugged, they said that it's the first time they feel love. Hallelujah. But you are in the house of God and you have a God that loves you with an everlasting love. You have a God who have this agape love for you. You are blessed with all spiritual blessing. You were predestinated. If you look in verse 5, he said that you were predestinated to be adopted. He said that in verse 6 that you are accepted in the beloved. In verse 7, he said that you were redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. In verse 7, he said that you receive forgiveness of sins. I am talking about spiritual blessing, somebody. If you don't see the earthly blessing, don't believe that you are not blessed. Know that you are blessed with all spiritual blessing. In verse 7 to 8, he said the riches of God's grace is abound to you. Grace means unmerited favor. Listen, you and I could not do anything to appease the wrath of God. But you have unmerited favor. The, the, the grace of God surrounds you in abundance. In Christ, there is abundance. There is grace without measure. And as you try to live the life, if you fall down, there is enough grace. To cover all your sins. In verse 9. He said make known to you the mystery of his will. That is a spiritual blessing. In verse 11. He said obtain mm, Jesus an internal inheritance. Jesus. In verse 13. He said that you have heard the word of truth. God's truth, God's word is truth. And it is light in the darkness. We are not without counsel. We are not left in the dark. We have heard the good news and discover a new path to life. And this is because we accepted Jesus Christ. In verse 13 also, he said that you are sealed, mighty God, with the Holy Ghost of Jesus of promise. Hallelujah, you are sealed with the Holy Ghost of promise. I want you to know somebody that you are blessed because you are not everybody can say that they are sealed with the Holy Ghost. The Bible tells the story of the rich man and Lazarus and, and Bishop spoke about it. And the rich man had everything. But he was blessed with all spiritual blessing. Hallelujah. He was blessed with all spiritual blessing. And what happened? The rich man died. And I told you earlier on that the rich man could not take any of his riches. But the poor man died. And the poor man received his inheritance. The poor man received the promises of God. This Holy Ghost has sealed you. It was prophesied about the prophet. And the manifestation is now. We have experienced. We are the generation that have experienced the Holy Spirit. And the promise is unto us. 
and we have experienced this promise. I want you to know that you are sealed with the spirit of promise. By this seal, the Lord know them that are his. This Holy Ghost that dwells within our being, the Lord knows that we are his. In verse 18, he says, you know the hope of your calling. Your calling is that you should live for God. Your calling is that you should not go to a devil's hell. Your calling is that you should dwell with him forevermore. In verse 18, he says, You are the riches of his inheritance. In verse 19 and 20, it says the exceeding greatness of his power. Paul says that the exceeding greatness of his power is towards you who believe. Who am I? I am blessed in heavenly places. And if I have all the spiritual blessing, I know some people, when they ask them, how are you doing? They say that they are blessed and highly favored yes that's right you are blessed and highly favored but some are trembling some are wondering what is happening because they have not seen the material things they don't see the house the car they don't see the husband they don't see some other things and they are saying god what is happening i wonder the devil is now putting it in your mind and you are wondering if you are blessed i am here under the anointing of the Holy Ghost to tell you that you are blessed. As of today, I want you to get that thought out of your mind. Satan, this thought is not of God. I might not see it, but I know without a shadow of a doubt that I am blessed with all spiritual blessing. Child of God, don't look at what Tom Joan has. Don't look at what Mary Sue has. Don't look at their bank account. Don't look at the millions of dollars that they have. Don't look at the Jaguar that they drive. Hallelujah. Because you have something far more valuable. You are blessed far more than they will ever be. Hallelujah. But you are blessed with all spiritual hallelujah blessing you are blessed with all spiritual blessing who am i i am blessed with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places i want you to get the thought out of your head that you are not blessed you might have a desire to own a house oh god I, 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 and this is your one dream. Before you leave earth, this is your one dream. But I want you to know that you are blessed. If you don't get a house on this earth, God has prepared a mansion for you. Oh, Jesus. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither have it entered into the heart. Oh God of men, the things that God has in store for us. You are blessed with all spiritual blessing while you are on earth. While you are on earth, you are sitting in heavenly places. And you are enjoying the spiritual blessing. But when I get there, when I get there, you are going to sing and shout when you see what God has in store for you. You are blessed. With all spiritual blessing. Don't let the devil tell you. I don't know why the Holy Ghost have me lingering here. But don't let the devil tell you. That you are not blessed. And you might want to hear me tell you. Oh bless the name of God. That I am blessed as a child of God. Because. My father is a millionaire. But I want to, to know that you are blessed with all spiritual blessing tonight. Who are you? I want us to turn in our Bibles again to the book of 1 Corinthians 6, 17 through to 20.
Who are you? I am the temple of God. Very important. When you know that you are the temple of God, and it comes right back down to what I started out by saying last week. When you know that you are the temple of God, you are going to draw a line. I am the temple of God. And because I am the temple of God, I will not allow anything to come and defile this temple. Let us look at the scripture. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So now that we have the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost has now come into our spirit, our spirit and the Holy Ghost is now one spirit. We are joined unto the Lord. Let us look at the next verse. So now that we are joined unto the Lord, the, 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 the apostle is now saying, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you which he have of God and he are not your own for he are bought with a price therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's who am I I am the temple of God. Being filled with the Holy Ghost, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, being repented of our sins, and trying our best to live a holy life, we have become a child of God. And being a child of God, our body is the temple of God. The temple of God is not a building made by the hands of men. The living God dwells within the born again believer. We learn in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 that a Christian body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are not just a house, but we are a temple. So as I speak to you tonight and you look at this body, this body that you're looking on because the Holy Ghost resides in there, this body is the temple of God. I want you to understand that God is interested in this temple more than 10,000 are 10,000 of auditorium that look so elegant and so, so nice and well put together with good colors. God is interested in this temple more than a million temple that is made with the hands of men. So we are not just a spiritual house, but we are a spiritual temple. 1 Peter 2 verses 5. You also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house and an holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So you are a spiritual house. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice to God. A temple is where people go to worship. Being that we are the temple of God, being that this body is the temple of God, it must, hallelujah, be a place of worship. It must be a place where worship springs from. It must be a place uh, that God is pleasing to inhabit. 
because worship comes from this temple. You are the temple of God. You are sacred. And God is looking at that temple even more than he does the temple that is built by the hand of men. Like the church of Corinth, many Christians do not know today that God considers them to be holy and sacred. Are they? No. But are too cozy with enjoying the things of the world. Rather than separating themselves from the ways of the world. Walking in the new man, the ways of the new man. They choose to participate in worldly activities that God has called sin. But I heard the apostle said in 1 John 2, 15 to 17. He said, love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is not of the Father, but of the world. Paul had to remind the folks at Corinth that their body was the temple of God. Tonight, I want to use this opportunity, Holy Ghost, to remind somebody, Jesus, that your body is the temple of the living God. You have received the Holy Ghost, but your conscience is somehow smeared. Your conscience is not alive anymore because of the things that you have been practicing. I'm not accusing anybody tonight, but I'm speaking as I feel deep in my spirit. I want you to understand tonight, somebody, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Paul reminded the folks at Corinth that their body was the temple of God, the actual dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. As a result, you should not be living the same kind of life that non-believers are living. Being the temple of God, I cannot be living the life that non-believers are living. I cannot be doing the things that non-believers, hallelujah to God, are doing. I cannot be doing the things, hallelujah, to defile the temple of God. If we turn in our Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians 6, 16, through to 18. We are the temple of the living God. It's not a joke thing. We are the temple of the living God. And what agreement? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean things. And I will receive you and I will be a father unto you and he shall be a son and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? I want you to know today, tonight, that you are the temple of God. And being the temple of God, you cannot have any agreement with idols. Being the temple of God, you cannot have any agreement with Baal. You have got to understand that if God is God, you have got to serve God. And if God is God and you want to serve him, that you can serve him. You can overcome everything that is placed before you and serve the Lord. You cannot have an agreement with Baal. You cannot have an agreement with idol. He said, come out from among them and be ye separate. When Jesus was crucified, uh, he purchased each and every believer with his blood. 
Jesus Christ has the title deed to your body. Hallelujah. A title deed is something that says you are the owner of something. Your motor vehicle has a title and your name is on the title and it says that you are the owner of that vehicle. The land that you owned, the title has your name on it. And the title says that you own that property. Likewise, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood, what he did was that he purchased that, purchased your body. He purchased your body as the temple of God. Jesus Christ has the title deed to your body. As a result of that purchase, believers no longer belong to themselves. I want you to know that you no longer belong to yourselves. Instead, each believer belongs to God. Therefore, we are to honor and glorify God with our bodies. Hear me, child of God. You are the temple of God. Who am I? You can answer, I am the temple of God. How is it that we are the temple of God? And we like to hear when the unsaved men whisper things in our ears. How is it that we are the temple of God? Yes, I know that as ladies, you want to hear that you are beautiful and you want to hear that you look good. But you like to hear, when you put on your clothes, you like to hear the unsaved men calling to you. You are not your own. You are purchased by Jesus Christ. As beautiful as some of these physical temples are, which were made by the, hand, the hands of men, God sees you far more beautiful and glorious God sees you far more beautiful than any physical structure built by men. This beauty comes from the glory of the living God that dwells within you. What agreement had the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Who am I? I am the temple of God. How are you honoring your body? Oh, are you honoring the temple of God? The temple doesn't belong to you. Oh, are you honoring the temple? Does your lifestyle glorify God? If you are not eating right, what deacon? I thought that everything is eatable. Once you pray, you pray over it and bless it, you can't eat it. God has given us wisdom to know that if we eat too much fatty food, it is going to be a problem. God has given us wisdom to know that if we drink too much sugar, it's going to be a problem. We're talking about the temple of God. What are you doing to honor the temple of God? What are you doing to give this temple of God longevity so that you can minister the word, so that God can use you to minister the word? If you sit in your house every day, I have news for you because there are some folks and some young folks, they sit around the computer every day and they do not go on the outside and walk for 15 minutes. Yes, deacon. I am talking about the temple of the Lord. The Bible says that bodily exercise profit little. But some folks are not willing to get the profit of that little. I want to tell you, child of God, that when you are physically fit, you'll find yourself being able to get up in the morning 
and pray. Hallelujah. If you're not doing the exercise, Holy Ghost, help me here. If you're not doing the exercise, you are losing out. That's just the way it is. Bodily exercise prof. You have to understand that this is the temple of the living God and we should do whatever it takes to give it longevity. So if you're not drinking the right thing, drinking too many sugary stuff, you're going to find out that little bit from this is diabetes. Lord help me, I love the sweet things. Talking to myself too, I love the sweet things. I try not to drink juice in the day because in the night I know that I like my sugar cane. And I even know I'm trying to cut down off eating so much of the sugar cane. Holy Ghost help me. If you are not wearing the right thing, you are exposing the temple of God. Glory to God. This is the temp. I want us to think of this, not of, as ours, but as God. And if we carry ourselves a particular way and expose ourselves, oh, bless the name of God, you are going to find out that you are exposing the temple of God. We must also make sure that we keep this body away from things that will destroy it. Keep our bodies away from things that would harm and defile it like fights. How is it that we are Christian and this body is the temple of God and we get in fight knowing that we could lose our lives? Holy Ghost. Yes, it is still the word of God in a different way. How is it that as Christians... We send around so much pictures with, with, with headless people, with people being killed. If we are keeping this temple of God, what that is doing, you know, it, 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 it's just I was doing some work in half a tree the other day and they stab a young man and everybody just walk past the young man. Who now video just walk past the young man like anything. So killing is the norm of the day. And as Christians, if we are protecting the temple of God, we should stay away from certain things, stay away from fights, stay away from, from the killings and all of them things that, that is going on. Right? Stay away from immoralities, stay away from adultery, stay away from fornication and from all evil. The Bible says that everything that we do is done on the outside of the body. But when we commit fornication that defile the body itself, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 17, he says that if any man destroy the temple of God, him will God destroy. What are you doing to the temple of the Lord? How are you uplifting the temple of the Lord? What are you putting in the temple of the Lord? Your body is the temple of the Lord. Who are you? I am the temple of God. Ask God to reveal to you the ways that you are to honor him in the temple. Ask him to help you to live a life that glorifies him. God is holy. It means that the temple which he dwells in must be holy. God is righteous. It means that the temple which he dwells in must be righteous. Hallelujah. Glorify his name. Who are you? I am the temple of the Lord. When you know that you are the temple of the Lord, you will make sure. I went to I went to a workplace some years ago.
and to how I see the young man spot the church sister on her bum. I know that that church sister had no respect for the temple of God. Your body is the temple of the Lord. If any man destroyed it, the temple of God, him will God destroy. Who are you? I have become the righteousness of Christ. Let us look at 2 Corinthians 5, 20 to 21. Who are you? I have become the righteousness of God in Christ. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ, Ted, be ye reconciled to God. For he had made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. I am going to read for us from the English Standard version therefore we are ambassadors for christ god making his appeal through us we implore you on the behalf of christ be reconciled to god for your sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Christ is the only entirely righteous one. At Calvary, Christ took upon himself and took the punishment we deserve, namely death and separation from God. Thus, by a marvelous work, by a marvelous exchange, he made it possible for us to receive his righteousness and thereby be reconciled to God. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 21, we read where Paul tells us that God made it possible that we be brought back in fellowship with him through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. Sin broke the friendship, it broke the fellowship that man had with God. But Jesus fixed that on the cross. Now when we accept the Lord as our personal Savior, and we fulfill the plan of salvation, we are reconciled unto God. The reason God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross was so that Christians could become righteous. As God is righteous. We have got to understand that Jesus was the manifestation of the Father. So Jesus bore the righteousness of God. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. So Jesus bore the righteousness of God. This righteousness of the Son is the same righteousness of the Father. The Hebrew word for righteous means to be lawful and to be correct. This refers to being lawful and correct in the eyes of the Lord. It is according to his requirements, his law, and his statutes. Thus, it is true especially if we look at Psalms 1, verses 2. Psalms 1, verses 2, the writer wrote about the righteous man. And he says, but his delight 
is in the law of the Lord. And his law doeth he meditate day and night. So the writer is telling us that a righteous man, his thoughts will be in the law of the Lord. So to be righteous, we said, is to be correct and it is to be lawful. And the word here in Psalms is saying that the righteous man delights in the law of the Lord and in the law do he meditate day and night. If we jump over into the New Testament, the Greek word means to observe divine laws or to be faultless. To be faultless, to be perfectly righteous is an impossible task for humans. To be righteous according to the meaning of the word, we would have to do everything that is right according to the will of God, according to his statutes and according to his precepts. For us to be righteous as God wants us to be righteous, we would have to be doing everything as God would have it. This, however, is not possible. Hence, this righteousness that we have is not anything else than the, that which God has wrought in us through Jesus Christ. Our righteousness cannot stand before the Lord. If we look at Isaiah 64, verses 6, we will recognize that if it was our righteousness only, then it would be over for us. If it was because of our righteousness only, then we would have no lot and part with God. We could not stand before God. But the righteousness that we are talking about is the righteousness of Christ. And just to show us that even when we are at our best, the Bible says in Isaiah 64, verse 6, if, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags and we all do fade as leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away so if it was based on our righteousness alone then we would have no lot and part with God our righteousness alone could not do it this righteousness that we are living in, this righteous person that we are seen as of God, it is because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When God looks at you, child of God, when God looks at me, he's not seen my righteousness, which is as filthy rags, but he's seen the righteousness of Christ. Just as Christ was made sin, listen to this, just as Christ was made sin for us. And in no other way can we be made righteous than for Jesus Christ's righteousness to be imputed on us. In the final analysis, being righteous is dependent on our faith in God. Paul strongly emphasized this in Romans chapter 3, right through to chapter 5. And he quotes even from Genesis 15 and 6 about Abraham to prove his point. And he said, And Abraham believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So Paul used the term being righteous. Is not based on what we do, but something we receive when we believe in the promises of God. Through faith in Jesus, we receive forgiveness of sins and we are acceptable unto God. Through faith, we accept this imputation of the righteousness of God in our lives. It, is, it therefore does not matter what we have done. Once we have repented, and I want to say this, once we have repented of your sins, God sees you through the righteousness Christ has imputed on you. Sometimes it takes very long for us to forgive ourselves. 
than the time Christ takes to forgive us. Sometimes we are very hard on ourselves. And immediately as we said, Lord, forgive us. He forgives us and he sees us as righteousness. We must know that if we sin, that we have an advocate with the Father. And if we sin, the best time for us to confess our sins is the same moment that we sin. Because the Bible promises us, it says 1 John 1 verses 9, it says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the passage is saying that if we sin, we become unrighteous. Or it's looked upon as unrighteousness. Especially when a person does a thing habitually. If we look at the meaning of the word, when somebody does a sinning act habitually, it is considered as unrighteousness. But when your heart is towards God, if you trip and you say, Lord, forgive me, God sees you as righteous. Who are you? I have become the righteousness of God in Christ. So being the righteousness of God in Christ means that the laws and the statutes God has be of God has become my standard. Being the righteousness of God, it means that the law, the statutes, and the precepts of God has become my standard. So though it is not of works, lest any man should boast, the standard that governs my life is of God. If you don't have standard somebody, you don't have guidelines that govern your life. If you don't have guidelines that govern your life, you will accept anything. It therefore means that we must have standards and we must have guidelines to govern our lives. If we are going to identify and overcome the enemy, this line that I have drawn, this line that you have drawn, this line that we have come together and draw, must be based upon the principles and the statutes of the Lord. If you do this, I guarantee that you will be able to easily identify the enemy. Who am I? I have become the righteousness of God. Who am I? And we are going to close on this tonight. Next week when we return, we will just look especially at who the enemy is and who this enemy is that we are up against. You will be surprised to find out how the enemy moves. You will be surprised to find out some of the things that he does. And we want to look a little bit at the enemy. But we spend almost two weeks looking at who we are because if we know who we are, then we can easily identify that this thing is of the enemy. Who are you? I am an ambassador of God. I am an, an ambassador of God. Again, if we go back to 2 Corinthians 5 verses 20, and I did say, I think, 2 Corinthians 6 is 2 Corinthians 5. If we go back to 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, Paul said that we are ambassadors of God. Now then, and I make sure that I read it from the English Standard Version. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. In the letter to Corinth, Paul discusses the ministry of reconciliation. If you go down to about verse 5 and 17, you'll see where Paul talks about that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses upon them, but has given them the ministry.
ministry of reconciliation. So Paul, in talking about the ministry of reconciliation, used the term ambassadors. Very important. Ambassadors for Christ. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. For God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Right? And we know the scripture. Generally speaking, an ambassador is a respected official. So I am an ambassador of Christ. He is a respected official as a representative of the nation. So in other words, the ambassador is a respected individual in his country. And because he is respected in his country, they now send him to represent that country in our next country. Sent to a foreign land, the ambassador role is to reflect the official position of the sovereign body that gave him his authority. The ambassador role is to reflect the official position of those that gave him his authority. I want you to know that it is Christ that has given us our authority. And we are ambassadors of God. Writing to the Corinth, Paul likened his own calling to that of an ambassador. And he urges all Christians to consider themselves as ambassadors for Christ. The gospel of reconciliation was always at the heart of Paul's preaching. In 1 Corinthians 1.17, he said, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Christians are God's ambassador in that they have been approved by God and are entrusted with the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 2 verses 4. As we go through this world, we represent another kingdom. Hallelujah. We represent a heavenly kingdom. And it is our responsibility to reflect the official position of heaven. It is our responsibility as ambassadors of Christ to reflect the official position of heaven. What is the, po the official position of heaven? I want to share with us that we know that as ambassadors, the official position of heaven is holiness. The angels, the Bible said, with two wings they fly and two before them and two cover their feet. And they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holiness is the position of heaven. As an ambassador, we must be holy. Holiness is the position of heaven. Uh, the Bible says, follow peace with all men. Holiness, without which no man shall see God. So holiness is the requirement. It is the position of heaven. You cannot see God without holiness. He said, be he holy. For I, the Lord your God, is holy. When you see me, you should be able to say, you should be able to tell that I am a representative of heaven. When you hear me talk, you should know that I am a representative of heaven. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We are children of God. We are children of the master that dwells in heaven. We are heavenly children. And as heavenly children, we are ambassadors of God. And being ambassadors, we should let the world know that the official language of heaven is holiness. The official language of heaven, the official pastor, the official being of heaven is righteousness. When you talk about God, you must talk about holiness. 
When you talk about God, you must talk about righteousness. When you talk about God, you must talk about love. When we as ambassadors in this world, people must know that we are love. People must know that we are righteous. People must know that we are holy. God's ambassadors are empowered by the Holy Spirit. We must take the message of our king to the ends of the earth and implore men and women everywhere to serve God. I want us to know that if we don't say anything, my neighbor must know that I am a child of God. My neighbor must know that I am an ambassador of heaven. My language, when I speak, my, my, my language, my tone, my everything should give me away. And they would say, no, this is an ambassador of heaven. When they took Jesus and, and Peter spoke, they said, even his very speech, give him away. You are an ambassador. The things that you do are they saying that this is what heaven is about? The things that you do are they saying that this is the language that heaven speaks? Who are you tonight? I am a child of God. I am an ambassador of heaven. Who are you tonight? And we could go on and we could go on and we could say other things that the scriptures say. But I just feel like these points are important to our lesson. These points are important to what we have to say about identifying and overcoming the wiles of the adversary. It's important that we keep these points in mind so that when the adversary comes in like a flood, we can say, I am a child of God. You can say, yes, I know my identity. You can say, yes, I know that I am owned by God. So you don't have to believe the lies from the adversary. You don't have to let him get to your mind and tell you things. You have to know who you are. And you are going to find that in the toughest of times is when you know who you are, you will be able to stand against the adversary. Like I said, I really don't want to go in it tonight. But we are going to talk about who the adversary is next week. And we are going to look at how he moves. We are going to look at the fall. And we are going to look a little bit at things to know that the adversary is wiser than us. To know that we are made a little bit lower than him. But through God, we are able to stand. Through God, he sees that we could not make it on our own. That is why he sent the Holy Ghost. Thank you, God, for the Holy Ghost. And if you do not have the Holy Ghost tonight, I want to encourage you that you need to receive the Spirit of God. The Bible says without the Spirit of God, you are none of His. I want you to know that there are two things that can prevent you receiving the Holy Ghost. One, you have not fully repented. And two, you have not fully surrendered. God bless you tonight. Thank you for tuning in. And we will all being well, continue the lesson next week. If Jesus come, I will not be here. Because I'm trying to live so that when he comes, I might be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, so that I might be with him. But God bless you tonight and thank you for tuning. Just, just tune in and, and just make sure that you, you get something and apply it to your life. Know who you are. Because in knowing who you are, you will be able to identify the enemy. Let us bow our heads. Father, we...
thank you once again. We thank you for what was said tonight. We ask that you cover us, your people, with your spirit and that you hide us underneath your blood. That you let your banner over us, God, continue to be love. We pray, God, that for those who are confused, for those who are troubled in their mind, for those who are not sure who they are, we pray, God, that some of that would have been cleared up tonight. Lord Jesus, or even in the future when somebody come upon this video, that God, it will just somehow touch them and help them to understand who they are. We pray, God, that you cover us as your people and that you will surround us with your love and your glory. Lord, let your perfect will be done in our lives as we give a thanks for being with us tonight. Have it your own way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.